Welcome back everybody to another lecture here in History 1301. And what we're going to be going over today is the age of Jackson, picking back up with Andrew Jackson as he ascends to the presidency. Now Andrew Jackson, as we've seen last time when we met in lecture, he had won the very important election of 1828. With it he had won mainly because of the result of this democratization process that had begun to take place even before his administration to where average Americans, mainly white male Americans, were given the right to vote. He was seen as a commoner, and because he could relate to people, this led to his election in 1828. With it, he would herald in a new era to where he would transform radically the presidency and presidential power. To use the presidential office as a vehicle to push forth what he saw as the will of the people, because he recognized that of all government officials, judges, representative centers, he was the only individual that was elected by all the people of the United States. And he saw that as a mandate to ensure that he pushed forth the policies they wanted to. And he will look to push forth things like destroying the Bank of the United States, pushing forth the Indian removal policies, things that were widely popular amongst the people. However, even though he was wildly popular amongst his supporters, he was very much hated by his critics. We'll see that many Americans will come to despise Jackson, and he would have an, administ an administration that you either love or hate. He would also have a very controversial administration, but today we're going to be focusing on his policies, how they impact the future course of American history and their significance. And at times we'll see he'll make major blunders, and at other times he would exemplify great aspects of presidential leadership. But anyways, as I mentioned a moment ago, he saw his election as a mandate by the people to push forth his policy. And he would like to push it forth as soon as he took office, and to ensure that the will of the people was supported by the federal government, he would look to use the veto power as a weapon to ensure that the will of the people would be listened to by Congress. Now prior to this, the veto power had largely been used by presidents just to strike down laws that they saw as unconstitutional. With the previous six presidents, they had used a total of 10 vetoes. However, during the course of Jackson's eight years in office, he would thwart that and he would issue out 12 vetoes to push forth his own agenda, to push forth what he saw as the will of the people, or just to push forth pure petty politics. Most notably, you see that first when he used the veto with the Maysville Road veto to strike down a law trying to build infrastructure. However, in reality, he probably struck it down because the author of that bill was Henry Clay, his great rival, who he believed had cost him the election back in 1824. But anyways, he would like to use that as his main vehicle as well has looked to stem out corruption within Washington by institute the, instituting the rotation and office system that would later become known as the spoil system that ironically over time would not beat out corruption, but rather would cause it. But nonetheless, he was an outsider that was taking over the office when he swore an oath, or swore the, um, uh, administered the oath of office and delivered his inaugural address on March 4th, 1829. Now, there are several things that we could talk about the Jackson administration. However, I'm going to try to keep it as short as possible and talk about the highlights of his administration. And one of the first issues that he would refer to during his inaugural address and then ultimately what he would like to hammer down when he took office early on in his administration was that of the Indian removal policies. Now, Indian removal itself is nothing new to American history. We have seen ever since the colonial period that American settlers have wanted to remove Native Americans from their ancestral homelands because Americans saw it as their God-given rights to those lands. So this was nothing new. Even in the days before Jackson takes over office and before he institutes the Indian Removal Act in 1830, several states had already adopted forms of removal policies. However, he wanted to accelerate that. He wanted to ensure that with rapid American expansion after the end of the War of 1812 out into the West, he wanted to ensure that all the lands that were east the Mississippi River would be freed for white settlers. And he would call on Congress in 1830 to pass an act, what he would propose to be his Indian Removal Bill, that would give him special powers to remove Native Americans out west of the Mississippi River. And with it, he would be allowed to establish treaties that would provide federal funding for the removal. He saw it as a great humane policy. And there will be some groups that would take advantage of this, but we'll talk about that here in a second. But anyways, it would be highly controversial when it was proposed to Congress. We'll see many of, the, of Jackson's rivals, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and a uh, frontiersman by the name of Davy Crockett would heavily oppose the Indian Removal Act. However, nonetheless, it would narrowly pass through Congress. But it will begin a very bitter policy. A policy 
that's impacted Native Americans' views of Jackson up to this present day. Now, with the Indian Removal Act, there will be a lot of resistance. Some groups will, under their own will, begin to move out west. They will cooperate with the federal government, but many won't. Most notably, the Sauk and Fox Nations up in the American Northwest, who would engage in what's known as the Great, um, or not the Great, but they would engage in the Black Hawk War, named after their chief. However, by 1832, having failed to restore their ancestral homelands, they would be forced out west onto the frontier. Not to mention a massacre would end that conflict. We'd also see that there would be similar resistance down in Florida with the Seminole Indians, who would engage in their own conflict against the U.S. Uh, government. And they would not be in a united front with those Native American tribes up in the Northwest. They'd be fighting on their own. They would be local actions. And the Seminole War that would rage down in the American... Um, and down in Florida, while most of the fighting will end in 1842, it will carry on for the next hundred years. But nonetheless, much of that nation would be removed. However, the Indian Removal Act will have a much more bitter legacy on one group of Native Americans, one that will take a very different stance in how it's going to resist the government or the um, policies of the Jackson administration, and is that of the Cherokee Nation. Now, the Cherokee Nation, it's a position in northwestern Georgia as well as parts of southeastern Tennessee, northeastern uh, Alabama, and so on and so forth. Now, the Cherokee Nation were a part of the uh, five civilized tribes that came from the region. And they were a product of policies that had been promoted ever since the Jefferson administration. During the Jefferson administration, Thomas Jefferson and how he, uh, or in how he dealt with Native Americans, he believed that they should not be forcibly removed from their lands, but rather they should assimilate to American culture, to come become intertwined within American society, begin to adopt Western customs, culture, law, and so on and so forth. And groups like the Five Civilized Tribes, including the Cherokee Nation, had begun to do this. Under treaties, they had begun to assimilate. They had begun to adopt Western names, Western customs, even a Western government. The Cherokee Nation itself had established its own constitution in 1827. Effectively, it was a nation within a nation. However, even though they had abided by the um, uh, abided by American policy up to this point, with Jackson's Indian Removal Act, that would completely change, especially even before it, when in 1829 gold would be discovered on Cherokee land. When this happens, white settlers from Georgia will look to encroach upon their land, take it for themselves, and the state of Georgia wants to ensure that that land was considered theirs. They would deny the sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation, and even when the Cherokee Nation appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, Georgia would fight against them. But nonetheless, the Cherokee Nation, in one of the few instances, would win their case before the U.S. Supreme Court, to where John Marshall, still on the bench in the 1830s, would declare that Georgia needed to respect the Cherokee Nation's rights. However, upon hearing this, Jackson would famously remark, or infamously remark, that John Marshall has made his decision, now let's see him enforce it. As he was determined to remove Native Americans we were living east of the Mississippi River out to the west. Now, over the course of the next several years after 1832, which was when that case took place, the, Native, or the Cherokee Nation will continue through, the law, or through law to resist being removed from their ancestral homelands. But by 1835, a small minority within the Cherokee Nation, only 10% of them, are going to sign a treaty with American diplomats that would cede over all the lands of the Cherokee Nation to the federal government and that they would be forcibly removed out west to Oklahoma. Now, those who had signed the treaty, one will be executed by the Cherokee Nation, breaking blood law. But nonetheless, the damage had been done. The federal government will ratify this treaty, and it wouldn't be Jackson who would see the removal of these Native Americans, but rather his successor, Martin Van Buren, to where the Cherokee Nation in 1838 would embark upon what's known as the Trail of Tears. Now, the Trail of Tears itself it wasn't unique to the Cherokee Nation, but in 1838, the entire Cherokee Nation, roughly about 16 to 17,000 strong, would be forcibly removed by almost 18,000 U.S. militia as well as soldiers under the command of Winfield Scott. They would be forcibly removed to lands out west. And along the route that they traveled where the trail gets its name, almost a quarter of the Cherokee Nation would perish. About 4,000 individuals would die by the wayside, not gaining the sympathies of those American soldiers. And this would leave a very bitter legacy for Native Americans, especially when they look back on Andrew Jackson. On top of that, they weren't the only ones who were witnessing their own trail of tears, because we'll see over 100,000 Native Americans by the end of the 1840s, or by the end of the 1830s, had been forcibly removed from their ancestral homelands as a result of Jackson's Indian removal policy. 
and in years to come, it would prove to be a major dark mark on his uh, administration. Why so many Americans, even today, view him as a very controversial president? However, that won't be the only controversy that he would get involved in and ultimately have some poor decision making. But we will see that this policy of Indian removal will live on long after Jackson. We'll see future presidents would continue it, and even as Americans begin to move out to the Wild West, out to the frontier in New Mexico and Montana and so on and so forth, they would continue this legacy left over by the Indian removal policy. Well, that's a topic for the future. In the meantime, as the Indian removal policy was beginning to take shape that same year, 1830, Jackson's going to have to deal with another issue, but this time he would exemplify excellent presidential leadership when he confronts the issue of nullification. Now, the nullification crisis, it will actually predate the beginning of uh, Jackson's administration. In the closing days of his predecessor, John and Quincy Adams, a tariff bill had been established, that of the Tariff of 1828, but it quickly became known to Southerners as the Tariff of Abominations. It placed tariffs as high as 30 to 50 percent on imported goods that heavily impacted the Southern economy. Not to mention many Southerners would also argue that this tariff did not protect uh, Southern, uh, the Southern economy itself. Tariffs were applied to iron and other goods, but they were not applied to Southern cotton, meaning that the cheapest cotton out in the market might not be Southern cotton, it might be European cotton, and that harmed the Southern economy. And in 1828, John C. Calhoun, who was the vice president under Adams and still the vice president under Jackson, had issued out his own silent protest, the South Carolina Exposition on Protest, stating that South Carolina, upon seeing this law, should declare their nullification, call a state con uh, convention, and nullify this law. Now, the issue of nullification, what is nullification first? Well, nullification was a process that was initially established in 1798 with the Virginia and the Kentucky uh, resolutions. Now those two resolutions were authored by James Madison and Thomas Jefferson respectively. And they had authored these in protest of the Alien and Sedition Acts of the Adams administration. And here they state that the states who had created the Union had the authority to hold conventions and declare a law nullified or void. And they gave them this power. Now at first they were challenging a law that was truly unconstitutional, however it would come to bite them back in the butt because through this process of nullification, especially by the 18, late 1820s, South Carolina would take it a step further, that if this law was not void, the federal government did not overturn it, even if uh, South Carolina had issued this nullification call, well, then they would secede from the Union, threatening disunion. This would spark debates by 1830 within Congress. Northerners would take the side of Daniel Webster, who would state that you must hold on to the Union, while Southerners would take the side of the Calhouns, as well as Robert Haynes, who were calling for nullification. Whether the nation was beginning to divide, once again on sectional lines, over this issue. Now Jackson himself, all eyes were on him. What was he to do with it? And he was sympathetic with the Southerners until they called for nullification, because while he may have supported things like state rights, he did not support states' rights over the Union itself. And when they threatened this Union, he drew a line in the sand. And he would heavily oppose them. He would condemn John C. Calhoun, which would contribute to their failing relationship. And by the time we get to 1831 and 1832, though, even though he had made it clear that he was for the Union, not for disunion and nullification, he still wanted to resolve this crisis. And at the beginning of 1832, he would pass a new tariff through, uh, through Congress, who, which he hoped would be a compromise to calm South, Carolinian, South Carolinians as well as Southern fears of the federal government. However, they were unconvinced. They still argued, or South Carolinians still argued, that this tariff was too high. And that if they accepted this tariff and the previous tariff in 1828, that they feared the federal government would next target their peculiar institution, the institution of slavery. And they would hold, in late 1832, in November, or South Carolina would hold, a state or a special convention within their state held in Charleston to vote on articles of nullification that if they weren't accepted, they would withdraw from the Union. They would secede. Oliver Jackson, as he heard this, he was outraged. And he would issue a very strong federal response. He would call on his Secretary of War, Lewis Cass, to begin to prepare for war and insurrection. And he would state privately that he wanted to go down to South Carolina, find the first nullifier, and hang him from the nearest tree that he could find. Not to mention one of the regrets he would state at the end of his administration is he regretted not hanging John C. Calhoun. 
But anyways, the crisis was quickly spiraling out of control. And it looks like in 1832 and moving into 1833, we might be on the verge of civil war. However, with great crisis comes in time for a great compromise. And in step Henry Clay. Henry Clay, he will become known as a great compromiser. He had already established a compromise to calm sectional tensions during the Missouri crisis. Now he will look to establish it during the nullification crisis. And behind the scenes, with the support of both Calhoun and Jackson, who are on both opposite sides of this argument, he would look to ensure that a compromise would be struck. He would agree to push through Congress a force bill, having the federal government given the authority to enforce duty collection within South Carolina, but on top of that, to appeal to Southerners and South Carolinians, he would also get a compromise tariff that Southerners, mainly South Carolinians, were appeased by. And on March 4, 1833, both of these would pass through Congress, find their ways to the deaths of the President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, and three days before he was set to take a second presidential term, he would sign him into law effectively ending the nullification crisis. And once again, everybody will look on Clay as the great savior of the Union and that the United States had avoided once again civil war. However, they had merely delayed it yet again. We'll continue to see that this sectional tension will continue to mount, surrounding not only tariffs and their economic differences, but also around slavery. But anyways, as the nullification crisis comes to an end, Jackson is going to turn his attention to something else entirely. Because as he begins his second presidential term, he was looking to finish off a war he had started against the Bank of the United States. Now, before the nullification crisis really came to a head in November and December of 1832, that year, 1832, was a presidential election year, and Andrew Jackson was up for re-election. Now, prior to the campaign of 1832, in the summer, we'll see that the head of the Bank of the United States, who understood that Jackson was no friend to the bank, is going to try to convince Henry Clay, as well as many individuals in Congress, to push forth a recharter bill for the Bank of the United States, which, if it wasn't renewed by 1836, the Bank of the United States would begin to shut down. And so four years before the, the uh, bank was set to expire, Nicholas Biddle, the head of the uh, Bank of the United States, wanted to ensure that it would survive, even if Jackson won a second presidential term, because he understood if Jackson won a second term, the bank would probably expire. And on top of this, as he was pushing forth this recharter bill within Congress, he would dare Andrew Jackson to veto it, stating that if he vetoed it, basically he would provide funding to his opponent in the upcoming election. Jackson saw this as blackmail, and he used the power of the veto, striking down that recharter bill and setting as the main issue in the election of 1832 to be whether or not Americans wanted to continue to see the Bank of the United States function or if they wanted to see its doors shut come 1836. Now, the Bank of the United States, just to recap it a little bit, or I should say the second Bank of the United States, it was a, private, uh, it was a private, uh, privately run institution. It could issue out loans, it issued currency, and so, so on and so forth, and it wasn't really overseen by the federal government, even though it controlled its revenue. And Nicholas Vidal had created somewhat of a dictatorship over it, and many people were suspicious of the bank, especially after the Panic of 1819, that it created this corrupt class. And Jackson himself included that, especially as he sees this call by Nicholas Beidel that he would support the opposition if Jackson didn't support the bank. And in 1832, as Americans went out to the polls, once again, they voted for the common man. Andrew Jackson would win a second presidential term, and as he begins a second presidential term, it was assuming that the bank would not have its recharter signed, and it would expire come 1836. However, Nicholas Beidel, after losing the election of 18 or, or his candidate losing the election of 1832, he wants to ensure that the bank and its power would be demonstrated to Andrew Jackson, and hopefully he would change his tone. And in 1833, Nicholas Beidle would begin a depression. He would withdraw money from this money supply, shortening it, causing widespread suffering. America, over the course of the next two years, would begin to suffer. And Jackson would not back down. He was staunch, and he would tell Americans that Nicholas Beidle was withholding funds from the American people, whilst Beidle would make the opposite argument, saying that there was a shortage. And as the Depression got worsened, we see critics of both sides would begin to target them. Most notably, there would be an attempt on Jackson's life, even though he would avoid the assassination. 
But nonetheless, by 1835, after Jackson had been censored, after his life had been threatened, he was victorious in his war against the U.S. Bank. Because Nicholas Beidle would begin to dump funds into the American economy, and Americans now knew that Beidle had been lying. And they supported Jackson. And by 1836, no Americans would have pressure to renew the charter for the Bank of the United States, and it would begin to close its door. That charter would expire, and by 1841, the Bank of the United States would be no more. Now, over time, and because of hindsight, we understand that this was a great folly by Andrew Jackson, who did not truly understand America's fiscal policies, because with the Bank of the United States, it allows the federal government to regulate the economy, regulate state and local banks so they're not issuing out money left and right. And on top of that, in times of depression, they could put much needed funding into the American economy to help it recover. However, while the destruction of the Bank of the United States will cause a boom and bust cycle for the next cent almost century because we won't see a national banking system until we get to the Federal Reserve System in 1913. At the time, it looked like a wise decision. In 1836, the U.S. was generating a surplus. There was prosperity, and Americans will support Jackson's efforts. However, when Jackson begins to call on federal land that was being sold during this period to be collected, not by worthless paper money being issued out by local banks who had taken over the Bank of the United States, but rather called for the collection of gold and silver to pay for these lands, it began a process eventually leading us down the road to depression, which he would not have to deal with during his administration, but rather his successor would have to deal with. And in 1837, the nation would once again be gripped by financial panic. To set up the stage for the Panic of 1837, in 1835, the same year that we start to see the bank begin to shut down, we'll see that Andrew Jackson had announced that he would not run for the presidency. And the Democrats would nominate somebody else, that of Martin Van Buren, who was Jackson's right-hand man and who was the founder of the modern-day Democratic Party. He was the ideal candidate, and because of his association with Jackson in the election of 1836, even though that this new political party, that of the Whigs, had emerged, and even though they championed the American system that was promoted by Henry Clay, as well as John Quincy Adams, we'll see they would stand no chance in the upcoming election. They would try to divide the vote, but rather they would ensure a pathway for Van Buren to gain office. And in, 1830, in March of 1837, Van Buren would take the presidential oath of office. But two months later, because of Jackson's efforts to shut down the Bank of the United States, a financial panic would ensue. We'll see that as a result of several factors, mainly because of a shortage of gold, as well as plummeting prices in regards to cotton, and the fact that the Bank of England wasn't funding British uh, companies that would invest in the American economy, it led to a worldwide depression. And this would become known as the Great Depression of its time. And Americans would suffer for the course of the next four years, and all Americans will begin to blame the Democrats who were in party, uh, power. They would blame Martin Van Buren, call him Martin Van Ruin, and by 1840, as we approach another presidential election, he was unelectable. And the Whig Party, that had been recently been formed as an anti-Jackson party, will rise. And we'll see that the Whig candidate, William Henry Harrison, would win that election and end the age of Jackson. However, this t stage was still set for continued fighting between these two political factions. Not to mention, as we end the age of Jackson, as Jackson left office, as Martin Van Buren leaves office in 1841, the nation was in a much worse state. No longer was there a sense of nationalism, but rather a sense of sectionalism. And this sectional tension, especially as Americans begin to go out into the West, will only heighten and eventually lead us down the road to civil war. But we'll talk about that in a future lecture. But anyway, today we're going to go ahead and wrap up with our uh, lecture over the age of Jackson. But just like always, before we end this lecture, make sure you complete all outstanding assignments. Make sure you read the corresponding textbook and the um, uh, corresponding uh, chapter in the textbook. And also make sure that you uh, keep up with all the required readings. But otherwise, if uh, everybody go out, be safe, and I'll see you all next time.